Hello, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Live on Facebook and YouTube simultaneously because we have the technology to do that. Now, I am going to answer a few questions today. So if you've got any questions you'd like to fire in, they will come through onto this iPad here and I will read out the best ones and uh, hopefully give you some answers to whatever it is you want to ask. Now, what do I want to talk to you about first of all, while we uh, wait and see uh, what questions you've got coming in? I want to talk to you about a photographer, a, a photographer whose work I admire uh, for many, many years. He's an absolute master at what he does. His name is Tim Flack. Now, if you haven't heard of this guy, you need to see a little bit about him. I'm going to play you this video so you can see a little bit about Tim Flack. Hopefully you're gonna have sound with this. Let's take a look at this. Now this is Tim's work. He's an animal photographer, an, an amazing, amazing photographer. He is coming to our studio, hopefully not with that tiger. And um, he's gonna talk about his work. He's coming in on our talk show. And you're gonna get the opportunity to ask him questions. So, um, this is a really great opportunity uh, for you to engage with a world-class photographer, top photographer. Let's take a look at some of his images and why I think this is important for all types of photographers. It doesn't matter, obviously, if you're not an animal photographer. It doesn't matter if you, uh, you know, are a different type of photographer. There is a lot that can be learnt from this guy if you're into photography. Let's take a look at some of, his, some of his pictures here. These are a few of his pictures. Some of these are new, some of these are, these are older ones. But we're talking about um, an absolute master of his craft here. A guy who shoots studio or location studio based images of animals. And he's just produced this um, new book called Endangered. And in this book, he's basically photographed some of the world's most endangered species, uh, the ones that are close to extinction, obviously, and documented them and, and, and got them all in this brand new book. So he's coming on to talk about this book, but we're also going to see some of his amazing uh, work and discuss some of his techniques. I mean, one of the things I love about Tim's work is, obviously the attention to detail is exquisite, the lighting is exquisite, but it's, also his post-production work because his images take on a sort of old masters painting quality about them. Let's just go back to that picture there. Look at the, the detail in the tone and the shadow and the highlights and the way everything is controlled. And interestingly, what I find that Tim does is he actually shows amazing three-dimensionality in his work through very careful control of tone uh, and contrast and it's almost like he doesn't push the contrast too far he keeps the contrast levels well within the blacks well within the whites and yet the mid-tone contrast is really rich that gives the images a, a real strong three-dimensionality and I've spoken to Tim before met him a couple of times at different shows and things and I, I've asked him about his post-production work and he's been very kind to talk about his techniques and give advice on on where he guides the eye through the use of burning and dodging and shading and sharpening. Let's just go and have a look at a couple more of his shots here. Um, you know, look, look at the exquisite detail. Look at the exquisite tonal range here in these images. Look how he's not, not only the, just the post-production work, but the, the capture itself in choosing the right moment or at least choosing the final image, the right, you know, the moment that uh, depicts the animal um, absolutely perfectly. Uh, and, and the animals take on these characteristics that we sort of identify as human. And one of his previous books was More Than Human, uh, where, um, you know, we start to see human traits in the animals that obviously aren't there, but it's our perception of those traits that we project onto the animals. And we take a look again here, you see we start to see this throughout these pictures, and it's just spectacular photography with spectacular post-production work. And I wanna really delve into that with Tim. So when he's here on the show, I'm gonna ask him a lot of questions about his work. Um, we're gonna have about a one hour, one and a half hour talk show. This is gonna be live on carltaylereducation.com on February the 22nd. 
So on February the 22nd, uh, I'm not sure what the time is. Let me just go to my uh, browser here. I've got it down here. Let's have a look. So February the 22nd, so 1800 GMT, that's six o'clock UK time PM. Uh, that's 1300 EST, that's New York time. Live talk show with special guest Tim Flack. Hope you can join us. If you're into photography, there is so much you can learn from this guy. I've learned so much from this guy, just studying his work, talking with him uh, and, and you know, admiring his work over the years. He's published loads of books. He's had, uh, countless exhibitions around the world. Um, if you'd like to, to, to find out more, head over to carltaylereducation.com and uh, click on this uh, live, on the live shows page and that will take you through to uh, this blog post we've put together there um, about Tim coming on the live show. We've also got a video a more extensive video on uh, on YouTube that we put up as well uh, about Tim coming on the show. Right, we've got a, a couple of questions. I'm going to um, before I move on to my next topic, let's just take a couple of uh, questions here. First one's from Wesley Langston. Says your favourite modifier. Uh, my favourite lighting modifier all round for beauty and uh, portrait sort of fashion headshots would be the uh, Para 133. That's the Bron Color Para 133. Um, I just think it's a really good all round workhorse. I also use it on product photography as well if I'm not uh, getting a reflective surface of the product because I can concentrate a spot of light that isolates the product quite nicely. So that's probably my single most favourite one. Heba Ahmed says, what is your thought process planning before starting any new project? Well, it's quite interesting actually, Heba, because I did a talk about this uh, for Hasselblad at the SWPP convention in London uh, a week or so ago. And it was all about pre-visualization and about my thought process. I'm not gonna go into that in detail right now, and I'll tell you why, because I'm going to do a free broadcast, about a 40 minute broadcast, on exactly that subject. So I'm not gonna start chewing it up now because I'm gonna do a complete whole broadcast about thought process planning, pre-visualization, and what it, what it is to sort of understand imagery and, and, and how to think about it. So we'll save that for that one. Hopefully you can join us on that. Next question from Rafi Khan says, how can I get better contrast in evening shoot portraits? Well, if it's evening shots, Rafi, and the sun is low in the sky, you'll be having sort of side lighting coming across the uh, face, um, and you'll obviously have shadow on one side if you didn't introduce a reflector on the other. So your contrast should be pretty good if the light is strong enough and contrasting. If it's overcast and it's cloudy, you're going to have low contrast because you've got large uh, flat light. So basically large light sources give you uh, flat light, soft light, and small light sources like the sun, point light sources, give you high contrast. The beauty at sunset is if you use the high contrast light of the sun, you also get the sun cutting through the Earth's atmosphere at a low angle, which diffuses the light and often diffuses it with a red or orange tint. And that softens that harsh light just a bit that makes it more pleasing to look at. So shooting at sunset is, is quite a good time. Um, Jeffrey Height says, is there a formula for how large a light source you should use to light a model head to toe? My instinct said, bring my umbrella in nice and close for soft quality light, but then the top of the body gets lit much more than the bottom part of the body. Instinct then says to consider inverse square law and move the light back, but then it's no longer soft quality. What's your thoughts? Jeffrey, that is very simple. Simple physics to answer. I can understand why you might be confused for it, but there are some simple facts. I'm gonna stand up and go over here so that I can see a full length, right? If we're talking about a full length person and you need to illuminate them, if you just put an umbrella, which way do I need to go? I need to go this way. If you put an umbrella just here, then of course that umbrella is only gonna light here. There's no light down there. So there is only one way you can light a full length body. And that is to have a full length light that goes all the way down from top to bottom. Now, if you don't have a full length softbox, like one of the big 120 by 180 softboxes, then you can use a big roll of diffusion material and shine a light through it. Or you could use a big poly 
board, what we call, uh, we use them in the studio, poly boards, or a mobile white wall or a white panel. Poly boards are used for insulation in, in building work. You can put a poly board or two big poly boards and shine a couple of lights into those. But if you want to illuminate a full body, you need a light that's the same size. It's that simple. That's the physics. You cannot break the law of physics, okay? So that is it. That's what you have to do. You have to have a full length light to match the size of the object you're shooting if you want to get soft light because you need that light to be close to them to get soft light. And you're absolutely right, Jeffrey. If you move the light further away, it's going to be higher contrast. But moving it further away is just making the light smaller. That's why it becomes higher contrast because it's the apparent size of the light from the subject's position that matters, not the actual size of the light itself. Right, next one, Razor 2048. What a name. What a name, Razor. Have you tried the pixel shift feature on the Hasselblad H6400C? No, I haven't. That, I can never, that is a H6100C that I've just recently purchased. And it's amazing, absolutely amazing. It is 16, 16 stops dynamic range, I think, but the files are absolutely exquisite. Uh, uh, the H6D400C's only just come out. I believe my uh, friend, fellow photographer, Sean Conboy, architectural photographer, who is actually going to be a guest on our show soon. Where is he? Here he is. Here he is there. He's gonna be on soon. Sean, I believe, has tried that camera and um, he was raving about it. So um, yeah, it, it's an amazing bit of kit, but obviously it can only shoot still images because nothing can move while the pixel shifting part is happening. They've got a demo of it on the Hasselblad website where you can zoom in on like this beetle and the, the amount of detail looks incredible. Uh, Adrian Daff says, Carl, mate, good day. Where do you buy those fake ice cubes from? Um, actually, I think we get them from the fakeicecubecompany.com. There you go, nice and simple. Giacomo Cordella. Did I say that right? You reckon that was right? Anyone? Was that good? I don't know if I said that right, but let's try it. Let's have another go. Giacomo Cordella. I don't even know if he's Italian. I don't know what he is, but there we go. Hey, Carl, have you ever used reflectors for high speed liquid photography? Would it make my lighting slower? No. Okay. Let's get back down to the physics of photography. Light travels at 136,000 miles every second. Okay, that's how fast light moves. It can get to your reflector and back to your reflector before you even had time to consider that it could do that. Before you had time to even do anything, it did that. So light reflecting from your light source off a wall back again is so instantaneous, it won't slow down anything. The only thing that will ruin your liquid shots in using a uh, flash or a burst of flash it's not how quick it will bounce off of something and back again, because that's almost infinite in, you know, in photography terms. They're so fast, it's not even worth thinking about. The thing that will slow it down is if the flash burst itself lasts for too long. So if your flash, what we call flash duration burst, happens to be a long burst of light, then you're recording the image for a longer time. So we use the, 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 the Broncolor, the Cirrus or the Scoro packs, which have an extremely fast flash duration of like one ten thousandth of a second at T.1, which is like a one twenty thousandth of a second at T.5. That's fast enough to freeze liquid flying in the air. Certainly don't have to worry about um, reflected light slowing it down. As a matter of fact, you'll see on one of our videos that we did with uh, these paint flying in tins down ski ramps, you'll see there's some reflectors below the tins of paint. So no, you're, you're never gonna compete with the speed of light, so don't worry about that. Next one, um, Yasa Ghulam. Is there a possibility that you will invite a newborn photographer live on Carl Taylor Education? So a newbie photographer. Um, I don't think so, Yasser, and the reason would be that um, what are they going to be able to offer to the audience that's watching? Newborn. newborn. Like, but newborn baby. Ah, okay, okay, like a newborn baby photographer. Um, maybe one day. Um, there's the very famous one, Anne Geddes, very successful newborn babies photographer. 
if that's what the question means. So if Anne Geddes would like to come on the show one day, then we'll be happy to welcome her. But while we're on the subject of new photographers, let's take a look at this, right? Um, here we go. Daria Belakova, right? Absolutely amazing photographer, uh, fashion photographer. She is coming on the show in around about May and she is an up and coming, what we call an up and coming successful um, fashion photographer. We've got a blog post here on her. She's gonna be coming on the show in May. I believe Daria's in New York at the moment working on some projects there, but um, she's gonna be uh, over to see us. She's coming over to London and coming to see us. Um, so this is, this is Daria. She's gonna be an amazing guest on the show because she's an up and coming star in the world of fashion photography. And I'm really keen to, in, in, uh, what's the word? Interviewer, that's it, interviewer, because she seems miles ahead of her game for her age, okay? Unless, of course, she's 40, but she looks 25, which I don't think so. I think she is still quite young based on what I've read on her profile. But I think it's going to make a really interesting interview because her work looks years ahead of her age, if you see what I mean, in terms of I think it takes a long time to develop a photography sort of skill set uh, or a photography look or style, and yet she's got quite a unique style that I really, really like. Um, so, so she's a new up and coming star in fashion photography. I think so anyway. Um, Lynette Stewart, will you be at the WPPI Las Vegas this March? Lynette, I'm afraid I won't. And the reasons are, is that I have 10 million things to do at the moment. And um, I've also possibly got another commitment for a show here in March um, in the UK, but I'm not even sure I'm gonna be able to make that one with my schedule at the moment. Um, I am keep flying around all over the world doing bits and pieces, and I just got back at the weekend from somewhere, and I have got tons of work to do, so probably not, but I would love to be there one day. Paul May says, hi Carl, is there much difference between say the Nikon 850 or the Canon 5DS? and a low-end medium format camera such as the Hasselblad X1D. Thanks in advance. Um, Paul, the Nikon D850 from what I've heard is a spectacular camera. So is the Canon 5DS. But the again, back to physics, medium format is, is generally gonna win the day. I was gonna say it's always gonna win the day because it's a larger sensor and a larger sensor can record more tonal range just in the same way that film could in the old days. Um, so medium format is pretty much gonna win all the time. Hasselblad has excellent optical quality. Um, I did a test on YouTube recently of the Hasselblad H6100 against Sony 42 megapixel full frame camera and you'll see the difference in the results on those files. So um, you're, uh, you're, the results speak for themselves. I would recommend though before you go down this route you've got to think about what you want to use the camera for because they've all got advantages the 35 mil cameras can shoot quicker they can shoot faster so if you're doing more photojournalism or wildlife that might be a better option if you're looking for pure image quality for landscapes or portraiture or some um, genre of photography where you can speak slower speak slower shoot slower i'm saying speak slower because i'm talking too fast where you can shoot slower then uh, medium format will suit your purpose better so Test them, try them, rent them, do all that before you buy them. Right, April Keller, do you have internet to run Lightroom? Do you have to have internet to run Lightroom? I'm not sure. I think you can still buy Lightroom as a standalone copy, but now it's on CC. We use it on CC, which means that I think you pay like £9 a month or $10 a month and you get Photoshop and Lightroom together. But I think you can still buy Lightroom as a standalone product. Mm. Richie Hall says, hi Carl, great to meet you at the SWPP in London last week. Hello Richie. Now I know Richie's one of our members on Carl Taylor Education because I've seen his comments and I've answered him a few times. What location kit would you recommend? I'm looking to buy so I can learn to shoot locations. Well, if you're talking about lighting location kits, I like the Cirrus Ls, the lithium battery Cirrus. Um, they are great uh, location lights, powerful. You get a lot of flashes out of that lithium battery. The lamp heads are maybe a bit heavy. If you're trying to put them in paras, you'd need to sandbag them uh, to stop them tipping over. The other option is to go, say, move pack and then you can use the pack with the smaller lamp heads so that they don't tip over. There are other portable lighting systems like, um, what are they called? Profoto. 
You could also use speed lights as well, but then it's more difficult to get different modifiers. So you've got to think about the whole system and what you want to do, whether you want to use what sort of lights and modifiers and what sort of stuff you want to shoot on location uh, to think about. But certainly check out the Cirrus Ls, see if they're within budget. If they're not within budget, then Elencrom also makes some uh, location stuff as well, I believe. Right, now I'm going to take a couple more questions and then I'm going to move on to my next topic of whiskey photography, alcohol or beverage photography. Now, what question have we got here? Loic Mathis says, hey Carl, when is the next Chanel shot going to be online? The first one was so awesome. Yes, it was. And the next one is even better. Let's just go over to our website a second, into the product section. Okay, I'm going into the product section. Come on, internet, come on. Here we go, right, so we've got this product photography section. We've got food photography, we've got all types of product photography in here. We've got tons of stuff. You get all this for £12 a month or $14 a month. You get portraiture, you get fashion, you get beauty. This is the, one of the, the, the recent um, Chanel shots that we did. Uh, this one here, and I show you start to finish how that was captured. We also did the perfume bottle, and we've got this other great new shot coming up. I'm going to show you it because I've got it here on my website on carltaylorportfolio.com. So we've got the tutorial for this shoot coming up very, very soon. We've got a date for it as well, haven't we? I've forgotten what the hell it was. I think it was the 13th of February. So in answer to your question, it is going to be published on the 13th of February on carltaylereducation.com. Now, if you're into photography, any type of photography, whether it's product photography, whether it's um, portrait photography, whether it's um, whatever, we've got it covered here. Look, we've got carltaylereducation.com. We've got beginner's stuff. We've got advanced uh, amateurs, enthusiasts. We've got portraiture with lighting, with natural light. We've got fashion modules. We've got product photography. We've got post-production. We've got the business. We've got equipment. We've got downloads. We've got live shows every month. We've got everything, and it is amazing, right? Our audience... Let's get back to this camera, Ash. Let's get back. She's lost the plot. Right. Our audience is loving it. Our membership is growing dramatically. We're keeping it cheap so that we can encourage new members, we believe, by offering a really good price and a really good deal, £12 per month, and giving you access to every bit of training we've made in the last 10 years. And we're making new training courses every month, new live shows every month. We believe it's a fantastic deal. If you haven't looked at it yet, Go and look at it, carltaylereducation.com. Sign up for a month and cancel. We don't mind. We know you're going to love it, okay? So just check it out and see. But anyway, as that uh, Loic Mathis said, um, he thought the last one was awesome. Uh, the next one's going to be up February the 13th. Joseph Josephy, Carl Taylor overpowering the sun. It's possible with continuous light? No or flash? Is it possible to make the same light as the sun in the morning? and erase the shadows on the model with continuous light. Uh, if it was early enough in the day, you could use continuous lights, but you'd need very powerful continuous lights. You'd probably need HMIs and they cost a fortune. Um, so no, flash gives you more power. That's why we use flash, because the amount of light that comes out of a studio flash is massive, but it's so brief that you don't notice how bright it is. If it was on, all the time at the power that it comes out in that brief moment, you wouldn't be able to look at it, okay? So that's how much more powerful flash can be than continuous light, which is why I find flash far more versatile. The other problem with continuous light, and I do use continuous light sometimes, HMIs, you can use them on fashion and stuff, but for the model, when you've got like a really bright HMI light and a para shining on them, the glare just gets too much, and honestly, they get face ache from using that level of continuous light. Flash burst doesn't bother them. It's just there and it's gone. So that's why I prefer flash burst. And also flash burst has the advantage of fast flash duration for freezing moving fashion shots or dancers or liquids flying or whatever. Whereas continuous light, you can't do that. You have to then rely on the fastest shutter speed that you have in the camera, which then means you've got to shoot with a larger aperture, which then reduces your depth of field. So the... Um, disadvantages of using continuous light outweigh the advantages of being able to see what you're doing. The advantages of using studio flash and the flash burst, fast flash duration, more power um, outweigh continuous light, in my opinion, um, and also the modeling lights that you get on the flash allow you to see what you're doing anyway. 
learning Studio Flash is easy. I mean, especially if you, I mean, look at this course here. Let's see if Ashley's on the ball getting the website up. Yes, she is. Here she goes. She's trying not to laugh there in the background. Um, right, I'm on the wrong section. I'm going to go to the portrait section, and I've pressed the wrong button. I don't need a definition of what portraiture is. I do know what it is. Right, lighting theory. These first 15 chapters in carltaylereducation.com explain everything you need to know about Studio Flash. Whether you've ever seen a Studio Flash, turn one on, pick one up, whatever, it doesn't matter. This takes you from the very beginnings of understanding the fundamental physics of light to begin with, to understand why you would even need to use a Studio flash and why you would need to modify it. Then we talk about the color purity, then we talk about flash duration, then we talk about flash syncing, then we talk about measuring light, controlling light, using modifiers, reflectors, flags, lighting stands, grips. Everything you need to know about Studio Flash is accessible in that module there on the website. Um, and as I say, members uh, are with us, love it, £12 a month, $14 a month. Um, check it out for yourself. Um, it's worth 12 quid to just watch one of those modules uh, and then you can see if you like the rest. Okay, let's take a couple more questions before I'm going to start talking about whiskey photography. Um, what does he say here? Ryan says, if a mono light is to be used in studio, only what would be the lowest power watts acceptable? I would say 400 joules. I've never worked, I've, I've, I've worked with light, sorry that are less than 400 joules, and I've probably thought, well, what's the point of that? Because a waste of time. So 400 joules is the minimum I would accept for a studio flash power to be useful to me. Adesh Jaswell, any advice for beginner photographers for career in this awesome field? I think is what he's asking. Um, it's, it's difficult, I'm not gonna lie to you. Becoming a professional photographer is very hard, okay? you need three main things. One, you need to be good. That's a given, because if you're not good, then it's gonna become apparent sooner or later. Two, you need to be able to market yourself really, really well, because there is competition. And three, you need to do all those things again, okay? You have gotta be good, and you have gotta market yourself, and you have gotta be passionate. You've just gotta absolutely go for it. And um, I know some photographers who are amazing, but aren't very good at marketing themselves. I know some photographers who are good, but are good at marketing themselves and they further their career. But I don't know anyone who's crap, but good at marketing themselves that succeeds. And I don't know anyone who's good, but doesn't market themselves that succeed. Okay, so it's those combination things. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's tough. Uh, and it's got tougher in the last few years. Uh, if, if I can offer some advice again, we've got a course on the business of photography where I show my marketing tips where I explain what I did to succeed in photography and what I do to retain my client base. Um, next one. Whoa, I'm never gonna pronounce this word, this guy's name, or girl's, I don't know what it is. Wojciech Homik, hi. How you, do you use Color Checker Passport with Capture One to get colors correct for product photography? Uh, that's covered in our modules, but basically I put a Color Checker card in our product photography, you have the gray values, you can measure the gray values, so they should be neutral, so you should know that if this value will be 175, 175, 175, red, green, blue channels, then uh, you also can check the color values of some of the given colors, and you can check whether they should be reading what they are, but that isn't always the most accurate way of doing things because your exposure will affect the color value as well. So I generally go with the gray card element and just make sure that the gray is neutral uh, so that the light is neutral. But if you're not using full spectrum lighting, so if you are using nasty fluorescent lights with part of the spectrum missing, then even if you neutralize, your colors aren't gonna be right, okay? You need to understand light really clearly before you can start considering color. Because color is just a wavelength of light, okay? All the colors that you can see are just wavelengths of light. So basically, this pen is absorbing all the colors of light except the blue wavelength, which is getting reflected back. Now, if the light source that you're putting on this pen is missing part of the blue wavelength of light, because the spectrum of that light is bad, then the blue won't be reflected properly, okay? So there are lots of physical factors, physic factors associated with light that are very important to understand first. 
Right, John Dawson says, Hi, I'm really loving your Carl Taylor education platform. How often do you or your staff reply to questions asked in the course comment boxes? They seem to linger there unanswered. That is nonsense, I'm afraid, John. I just actually answered about 30 questions last night and the only reason they hadn't been answered was because I was overseas for five days because I am the one who answers them all. Uh, there are, some of them are answered by the staff. At the moment in our comments section, there is not one single unanswered question. If there is, let me know personally. Email me through the website. We answer everyone's questions. We use it as our customer support service so that every question gets answered. Uh, and I don't believe there are any unanswered questions in the comment sections as it stands at the moment. There was a period of four to five days where I didn't answer some questions because I wasn't here. But the team also endeavor to answer the questions. But the problem is they don't know all the answers to all the questions. So they'll answer the ones they can and I will answer any other ones. Um, right, Duncan says, will the Para 88 and the 133 with a Cirrus produce the magical 3D light quality or do you need to jump up to the 222? Uh, no, you don't need to jump up to the Para 222. You only need the Para 222 if you're shooting um, more full length three quarter body shots. Let me show you an example. Um, so this one is with the Para 222 and you might have got away with that with a 133 but probably not. So at that sort of expanse of uh, the image then the 222 is an advantage. This is shot with a 222. So when you're talking about full length figures you need the bigger light source. But if we look at, um, let me find this one actually, where is it? Uh, I've lost it, I'm trying to find one here with the one. This one's the 133, um, lovely light from the 133. Um, but the Para 222 is used more for, hang on, having trouble getting my gallery back to thumbnails here. The Para 222 is used more where you're trying to illuminate a full figure from a long distance like this. However, in saying that, I've just noticed another shot in that Iceland series. This one I lit with two 88s, okay? I only used two Para 88s on that one. So it's more about knowing how to control the light. Para 88s, 133, 222, they all work really well. They've all got slightly different nuances and purposes. I've got a great video on YouTube actually where I compare lighting modifiers and show the different results from each of them. So Duncan, head over to our YouTube channel um, or head over to Carl Taylor Education because we put the video on there as well. Now, I'm gonna take one more question before I talk about whiskey photography or uh, beverage photography. Um, Hussein Nadia says, do you have any competitions coming soon? You bet we have. We always have competitions. Do you know why? Because we're so goddamn generous. Isn't it amazing how generous we are? Let's take a look at this. Competitions, we gave away, we gave away a Canon 5D Mark IV as a competition prize. We actually, have we, we haven't even posted about that. It's on the blog. Let's take a look at the blog. We never tell anyone anything. This is the problem. Here we go, on the blog, where is, there he is. So this guy, I, I presented him his prize. I presented his, his prize at the SWPP show. This was Marky Pearl, our model at the show, lovely girl. Um, we presented him his prize, the 5D Mark IV there, at the show, he came to pick it up. And uh, we do competitions every quarter. Let's jump back to the competitions page, if I can find my way around here. Competitions, so our next competition is win a um, tripod. $700, $800 tripod. And then after that, it's win a Cirrus lighting kit. So we give, we give tons away, okay? We're competition mad. We love our members so much that we give these amazing prizes away. But you've got to be a member to win. because so we're not going to give it to any old geezer off the street, are we? No, we're going to make sure you give it to one of our members because we love our members. Right, now, what I was going to do, I was going to talk about whiskey photography. Let's take a look at this, right? Live shows, our next live show, Although we spoke about Tim Flack, he's up on the 22nd of February. Before that, on the 8th of February, is this next week? I believe it's next week. On the 8th of February, look, Ashley's grinning because she's managed to figure out how to control the live deck. So she's all chuffed. Emma's still firing questions through to me, so I'm gonna answer a couple more questions, right, in a second. Let's talk about whiskey photography, right? 
On the 8th of February, I'm doing a live whiskey shoot. Why am I doing a live whiskey shoot? Well, because it's a popular area of photography and I'm gonna show you some examples here because I wanna, sh I wanna bring this up. This is, this is quite interesting. Um, let's take a look. Let me, let me load this, see if I can load these into focus software a second because this might, yeah, this could give us an interesting comparison. What I wanna talk about, right, these, this picture here is from one of our members. It's a good shot. This one um, was, uh, who was this one by? This one was by Andre, Andrew Chislett. It was a great, great effort from Andrew. This is another member's shot they sent in and one of our critiques, because we do critiques as well. This is by Daniel Swenson. But what I wanted to do was to show them how to improve these shots, okay? So I'm going to take shots like this and I'm gonna turn them into uh, shots like this or this, where the liquid looks, why, why, there we go, where the liquid looks amazing in the bottle. Now, for some reason, that JPEG has come out all wrong. So I'm gonna go to that one instead, and hopefully this one will load in. And no, that one's not loading in either. What a disaster, let's do it a different way. Let's bring this up. Right, so this is what we should be looking at. We should be looking at really vibrant liquids in our whiskey shots. Beautiful lighting on the bottles and on the glass. Lovely, elegant lighting on the label. All of these things to consider. So we're gonna shoot shots like these are shots that I've done in the past. Whiskey shots, beautiful liquids, all about the, 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 the what do you call it? The, uh, What's the word for when something's delicious? The desirability, but the, um, you know, want, making you want to drink it or eat it or palp, what's the word? I've forgotten my whole vocabulary's gone out the window. Right, anyway, we're gonna make that liquid look really desirable because what I noticed with some of my members' work that they sent in like this one by Rico is the liquid isn't punching out here. I mean, he's done a good shot there, but the liquid isn't desirable. This one's better, but still not amazing. This one, great shot on the glass and the ice, but the liquid isn't desirable, okay? And in this one as well, great composition, good angle on the bottle, but not enough concentration on the liquid. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna go from these shots that these members have sent in on the last critique to this sort of shot, okay? This quality of liquid, and lighting, these are some of the previous shots I've done for clients and for liquids and stuff here, beverages, whiskies, this sort of thing. And I'm gonna do a live show where we look in depth at the techniques on how to do that. We're gonna do a whiskey shoot from start to finish, from backgrounds, from base surface, to bottle, to preparation, to the whole shebang, to color schemes, to lighting, and we're gonna nail an amazing shot in that live show, live, on air, for you to watch. That is gonna be on air on Carl Taylor Education next week, 8th of February. What day is 8th of February? Does anyone know? Thursday is 8th of February, 1800 GMT, UK time, 1300 EST. If you can't make it live, you can watch it on replay. The benefit of watching it live is that our members can ask questions why they, while they watch it live, okay? Um, so we answer the questions while we're shooting. If you miss it live, you can still ask questions afterwards because we have the comment section, so you can ask questions, and we will answer those questions at a later time. Not too late, as John Dawson was worried about, but we will answer them almost immediately. So that's next Thursday, did you say? Next Thursday, right. Um, not this Thursday, next Thursday. Right, we're gonna finish up now with a couple of questions. Uh, we've got one here, says, Justin Holding. Hi Carl, I know you don't like talking about gear too much, but what do you think of technology like the eye autofocus that some Sony bodies have today? Really useful or just marketing hype? Um, they're not really useful to me because I pretty much manual focus all the time in the studio because I've got all the time in the world to focus and check the shot tethered, fine tune the focus manually, that's et cetera, et cetera. If you're shooting wildlife sports or events or things where you needed to respond really quickly, if an eye technology allows you to look to a certain spot in the viewfinder and the camera can recognize where you're looking and then it focuses on that point, that could be really good. And I think it would be really good for things like sports, wildlife and stuff like that. But I don't do that type of photography. So um, I've never used it. So I, I can't talk about it honestly, Justin, in, on the basis that I've never tried it 
All I could say is that it sounds great in theory, so if it works in practice, then why not? Hussein says, light, which light is better for automobile photography, HMI or flash? Well, actually, you could use both. Uh, they're both equal. This is one instance where HMI is good because it's pure daylight colored light, just like flash, and it's continuous. And in car photography, the car is not moving. All right. If the car's not moving, then you can take all the time you like and light it with all the continuous light you want. However, my preference would still be flash because you can still get more oomph out the flash and I'm used to using flash. So um, I would go with flash. Cedric Beasley says, hey Carl, before starting commercial photography, what lighting system were you using before Broncolor? Um, I used Elinchrom for about 12, 14 years, I think. Um, and I've rented Pro Photo and I've rented Broncolor. And then when I started getting more into fashion work and moving objects, models spinning, jumping clothes, and then more liquids flying around, I needed faster flash duration. That's when I switched to Broncolor. Richie Hall, what, Carl, what do you use for your website? I use um, Squarespace, which is interesting because I should mention, this is my Squarespace website. This is my gallery and I can put my Squarespace website together in minutes. I can add galleries, I can add uh, about pages, information, all this sort of stuff. And I love the quality that the Squarespace website produces. So I use Squarespace. If you wanna get a Squarespace website and you want 10% discount off it, use the offer code Carl at checkout. Right, next one. Um, Final question, Rick O'Neill, Lightroom or Capture One for shooting tethered? Which is faster and better? Capture One will definitely be better than Lightroom, but I actually use Focus, spelt with a P, P-H-O-C-U-S, which is the Hasselblad proprietary software that they use uh, and build for their cameras. Um, so that's the one I use. I don't think at the moment Focus works as a tethered solution for other camera systems. That may happen in the future, um, but Capture One, I would say, if you're buying software, um, to use for tethered would be a better option than Lightroom. I think that is it for the questions. So we're going to knock this on the head. I want to say thank you for joining me uh, today live on Facebook and YouTube. Don't forget, we've got the amazing Tim Flack, wildlife photographer, um, animal photographer, coming on the show. I've learned a lot from Tim just from looking at his work and talking to him. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask Tim questions live on the show. Um, some amazing work from Tim, uh, as you can see here. Let me just bring this up again. Um, this is some of his stuff. Oh, look, I just shut the thing. What an idiot. Right, there we go. This is a new book. This is some of his new work. Absolutely amazing stuff. Can't wait to interview Tim on the show. Absolute brilliant stuff. So you guys can ask him questions too, live on the show on the 22nd of February. And next week on the 8th of February, we are doing a live whiskey product shoot from start to finish. Hope you can join us on carltaylereducation.com. I'm Carl Taylor. We'll see you next time.